So welcome everybody to another episode of the J2 Hub podcast. We are on season two. As mentioned in the last show, this is more uh, DXB uh, focused. So most of the people I'm going to be speaking to are based in Dubai or they have come to Dubai for whatever reason. Now, like last week's guest, it's become a bit of a recurring uh, theme at the moment. We've got another person who originally lived in the UK, but is now in Dubai and has come to Dubai for several reasons. Now, one of the things this um, chap focuses on is um, holiday lets, which um, is something that I know a lot of people want to find out more about in Dubai. And our guest has been doing this for a long, long time, and he's uh, perfected it very, very well in the UK, has a great business model, has a great system. um, And I really wanted to get him on the podcast because I wanted to understand his whole journey from where he started in the UK and where his journey has led him to in Dubai, which is a very, very exciting journey, to be fair, because he's now diversified into other areas of real estate. Um, So it's going to be a very, very exciting episode. Um, And let me not stop you there. Um, Adam, Adam Rana from the UK, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me, James. No problem at all. Now, (laughs) me and Adam have spoken before on our podcast in, in season one. He was one of the very first early guests on the podcast when we had to do it over mm-hmm. Zoom because we couldn't do it live face to face. And let's face it, back then you didn't have all of this uh, fantastic stuff that mm-hmm. you got here in studios now. Um, and I remember when I first met you, Adam, I was um, I was really taken back by what you were doing in the UK mm-hmm. because you'd kind of perfected this great business model of holiday lets and Airbnb. I'll let you talk about that more later on. But before we get into that, Adam, can I want people to get a good understanding of your background because I think where you've come from and where you've gone clearly shows people, especially young people today, that nothing can limit your beliefs. Mm -hmm. Um, Where you start is not where you need to end up. And I think you've had a, obviously I've known you for a while, so I know (laughs) your colourful background and what you've gone through. But I think for the people listening, especially the young people starting either in real estate or people that are thinking about going into real estate or just business in general, Mm -hmm. give us a little bit of a background of how you've become where you you are today. And tell me, take me back to school or just take me back (laughs) to where you were in the beginning and how you got to where you are today. Okay, so um, uh, my name is Adam Rana, right? So the people who don't know me, I have a very interesting background. And as you've known me for several years now, um, from nothing or from corporate days to here, I'm going to take you right back, as you said. Um, so I actually, I'm not actually born in this country, in the UK. So, well, well we, I'm talking about UK now, I'm in Dubai. Yeah. Um, so I moved from Pakistan to England in when I was 14 years old. So it's the worst age to probably move as a teenager. <laughs> yeah. As you know, growing up in London, the schools are rough. You know, um, I, I grew up in council state. Uh, in fact, like rough, everything was bad. It's opposite to what I was used to. Like, you know, discipline. There was no discipline. There was, you know, fights and people doing all the bad stuff, right? Yeah. And I, when I, that's the, the, the toughest time was 14 to 19, my age group, until I went to uni. So the school was totally opposite of what I wanted. I wasn't smart, so I never had the the photographic memory. So I I was always get a C grades and the D. I would never get an A star or an A. So people, one of the biggest thing I say, people think, oh, you need to get an A star or A grade to be here where we are now. I I was not the the smartest kid in the school. Um, so uh, come uni times, so I just decided I need to get to a position where we're sitting on this table right now, sitting in a country like this and doing the things we're doing. This was the vision. I, 18 or F17, you want to say, and I chose to go through the corporate uni life. So I know it's not very accepted right now in the entrepreneur world, but I'm one of the people you're going to get on podcast, say, go to uni, honestly, go to university, yeah. um, yet still do your side hustle, right? Go to university, still do your side hustle, because university and the groups and the people I met from different nationalities and the groups and friends I made are probably the best thing that's ever happened to me. Sure. Sure. So, so university changed me, made me as a man where I am now, the way I speak, the way I hold myself and the character I am, it was the university, not necessarily the books. I'm an engineer by, um, I was a mechanical engineer. I've got a master's degree. Um, so I, it's not the actual maths or the engineering. It was the character that built in me in the four years 
of university, living away, away from parents, um, which I can give you categorically examples of people I know who didn't go to uni, straight into business, and nothing wrong with that, but you missed out on the on the experience of even living outside your parents' house. So, and, and yeah, it's all good with all social media. You can post and do reels and be like, yeah, I'm going to be the biggest entrepreneur in the world, but you got to get real life experience, mm -hmm. which I did. And which real life experience is like talking to, to, to yourself. Like, you know, you're giving me your experience of life four years over me or whatnot, whatever your age is. I think it's three, <laughs> four years. <laughs> Let's keep it less. <laughs> um, so that that's my story. That's my key change. I was even part of the, I was so focused on being the best. I even joined the army for the discipline. So that wow. was unheard of. This is in 2007. And if people know what happened in 2007 in England, you know, it was 2008 and um, probably wasn't the best time to join, but I went against the curve and I said, you know, best experience. I became, I nearly became a, uh, a uh, coach in skiing because of the army. So you do adventure training. So I was doing adventures, you know, jumping out of plane, jumping out this, going mountain climbing at age of 19. So 17 or 16, when I was in a council estate to age of 19, I was around people who are well-educated, come from great families and nothing, nothing wrong with the council estate. That's what drove me to be there. But it was the, that was the driver for me. The, the bad life was the driver, the, the rough, the nest, no discipline to be a disciplined person. So the army made me the disciplined person I am today. You know what, Adam? I didn't even know that. <laughs> I thought I knew you quite well, but the army, that's a new one yeah, for me, man. Yeah, yeah. So it was territory it was a territorial army, but they give you the full so I was um in officer training corps. So one of our friends, mutual friend, did that as well. Um so it's like when you're in the university, you can join to become an officer and go to Sandhurst. Sure. Um so I didn't finish the whole thing, but I spent three years, uh, which three is a long time while studying. So I I, I did it as a as a territorial army. So it was the greatest experience of my life. I still talk to my friends, uh, which I made there. They're serving full time, but it wasn't for me. Civil, civil life uh, was more, more, more for me because I felt I got the experience. I met the people. Now I can use that experience, and I took it into corporate life. I walked out of uni, graduating with seven graduate jobs. Right? Wow! Um, and that's not to show off, or that's not it, the reason was because when I went to interviews, it was like a podcast interview. They just wanted to know how you deliver yourself, how you talk. Um, how you carry yourself and how you communicate, basically. Sure, sure. Um, so because of that, I walked out with the uh, with a very good, very good jobs with BP. Um, what else? So I worked for Jaguar Land Rover. So that was my career. So that I, chose, I know. <laughs> yeah. So I chose the Jaguar Land Rover career because I just I'm into cars. Like I've just bought a, a V8. You know, you see. Mm -hmm. um, I'm into cars. I went into a grad job, but I didn't really want to be an engineer. But I wanted to be a leader. So leadership, so I was part of a leadership uh, grad program. Uh, and another another great thing that I would say made me after the army, because every day you're learning, you're a student. Um, it was the training that I got from the corporate world. It was, they spent over 150,000 pounds on wow. me. As back a then? Back then at 22. Mm -hmm. My salary was 38K, 38,000 pounds at age of 22. So pretty good, you know, coming from, like my life went from like here to here really quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not a it's not the, the biggest achievement. Um, I didn't know that at the time, and I went through the career ladder very quickly to a senior manager. Moved to Shanghai, uh, China. Launched a factory there for Jaguar Land Rover, one of the biggest factories in China that was launched for automotive. I was part of the launch there. I was part of the biggest launch in Europe for in Wolverhampton for a for an engine factory, which is on M54. Um, so you can imagine doing all of these things at about 24, 25, 26. Uh, it made me think. You know, hundred and fifty thousand pounds a year, hundred thousand pounds a year, brand new Range Rover. It really doesn't cut it for me, right? Mm. It really didn't. Um, people who know me, people who listen, a lot of friends follow me on Instagram from those days on LinkedIn. They were part of the journey. Um, they're directors now, they're they're managers, which is amazing. But it wasn't for me. Um, hundred fifty thousand pound a year, two hundred k. You know, an average age for a CEO is fifty, I think, or or maybe above. Um, one in one in hundred makes it which I would have made it, but I didn't wait till 50. I'm 33 years old now. I wanted to be a director. I wanted to be a CEO. I wanted to conquer the world. Um, yeah, here I am sitting in oh, front of you. Great. In Adam, let me take you back. Yeah. So you said your younger ages were on a council estate. Now, uh, I guess people in the UK listening will know what a council estate is. Yeah. Being in Dubai, where it's, uh, you know, the center <laughs> of luxury, maybe people don't know what a council estate is here. So 
in your own words, can you just give us a quick recap of what a council estate is for anybody listening from Dubai who's wondering what is a council estate? Um, I'll give you the professional version of it. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a housing society, you want to call it, or a housing state uh, mm -hmm. run by the go paid by the government. Um, government will house you, uh, people who are, uh, are poorer families. Uh, I would say not enough money to, 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 to live or do not have jobs. So the community is like mostly poorer families or, or, or below the minimum wage. Uh, people who don't have jobs um, are living in this in this state, essentially. Um, lovely people, um, not, uh, nothing wrong with that, uh, but it's just the mindset's not there. So it's a, it's a poorer area. That's the best way I can, I can, okay. I can put it. Yeah, okay. Adam, when you were growing up, um, what was your home life like? Um, so yeah, good point. So I was brought up by a single mother. Okay. Uh, so she, when she immigrated to the UK, uh, she brought us here without a dad. So uh, didn't have a dad from the age of six, I think, or seven. Um, I can't remember from the what I can remember of. Yeah, met him once or twice. Mm -hmm. uh, so all I know is a, is a female um, leader in my life. So maybe I get I get a lot of I have a lot of empathy for people. I have a lot of emotions whilst I have the business head. It's because it, from my mother. Mm -hmm. um, which is which is a key skill that you probably agree as well as being a father yourself. Um, so key skill has helped me come from my mother, and I'm very thankful of that. Um, so she has brought us up. I'm the eldest in the family and two younger brothers. I agree with you. I a similar situation. I lost my father when I was six, yeah. so I was brought up by my mother. You know, and I think um, I'm not embarrassed to say she was my best friend. I lost her a couple of years ago, um, sadly to cancer, but. She was, uh, you know, she was my big biggest fan. Mm. She was my biggest supporter, my best fan, you know, my best friend. And I think um, the mother quickly takes on the role of a father, yeah. I felt. And I never really felt deprived in any way yeah. growing up. And we grew, I grew up in London and, uh, you know, I, I lived very close. In fact, I lived opposite a council estate. So most of my time was spent in there. Although we lived in a home, yeah. a small terrace house, uh, my mum was always very determined to buy her own house. And she did that very early on. Um, but I know what it's like to see this, mm. you know, I know what it's like to see people that are deprived, that don't have everything. I mean, you go a few streets up the road and you see the young youths that are your age wearing the nice trainers, mm. they've got the nice clothes and you're thinking to yourself, shit, man, I, mm. I don't have this. Yeah. But at the same time, I think what a council estate teaches you and the private areas teach you is community. I felt mm. there was a lot of love. There's a lot of families where you could just go in and out of people's homes mm. Although you may have been in a poorer area, I always felt it was a damn good community in the sense that you could get advice from this person, yeah. you could go and talk to this grandma, you could go and talk to this person. And for all the faults that a council estate has, people are very entrepreneurial there. Yeah. It yeah. may not be on the right side of the law that people <laughs> are doing stuff, yeah. but I found some of the people I met in the estate were very very entrepreneurial mm -hmm. and you look at them later on in life and some of those traits are still with those Correct. and they're not in the council estate anymore Correct. but being in that situation they had to get themselves out mm. would you say that your early years of being in an estate did anything trigger in your head where you thought shit i need to get out of here at some point yeah yeah again you touched on a really good point the uh, the biggest thing is it was the there's loads of good things about living in a rougher crime high high crime area and stuff it drives you to get out of it i think it is in most of people but they don't have the environment to let them out if that makes sense mm. so i for me was the biggest driver that i'm in a in a bad part of the society bad in from from my from my terms like i wanted to be up here and be the most successful and achieving and conquering the world basically that's how i look at it this is my terms um and i said you know there are good good habits like people are entrepreneurial here. people are doing they're doing things outside the box mm -hmm. so people are doing thinking outside the box doing things uh, which we can't delve into but people <laughs> are doing some amazing things and i said okay you know i can do this like i can be smarter like i can use these key skills uh, the community um, the field used to how people work together teamwork people have great teamwork people know each other i use that skill put it into education use the education combine it together and apply it where you know, it's on the right side of the law and you can make a lot of money. So I, I chose all the skills that I learned. It made me tough. Like it yeah. actually made me really tough because I got into fights. I'm sure you got into... Yeah, yeah a few. Um, very different to Dubai again. I know I know we're sitting in Dubai. It's a total opposite. But there's so many things that happen that make you learn and make you a strong person. Um, I got bullied 
I got, I, I'm not afraid to say, but I was afraid to say before, but if I didn't get bullied then, I wouldn't be, be a leader now. I, I don't need to claim I'm a really good leader and I work really hard to be where I am. And before I was just thinking I can never be a leader. So what can I do? I can never make it. I, I genuinely believe that I couldn't make it before because of the environment I'm in. I was in. So now I use that to like drive me and say, look, you know what? I'm going to conquer. I'm going to go against the grain. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for my other point on this is like, there are people that I'm helping. I'm going back to my school. I'm going to go speak there. And I'm talking to people who still, I still go to these. I'm still near. I'm still, I live in, but I've got a house in Birmingham. So there is areas like London. I still go there, still meet these people and I'm inspiring them and I want to. And people actually, so when you come out, you come into their environment from outside, they actually want to listen. You'd Absolutely. be surprised. It yeah. just, we just never had the guidance, you know, but mm. I had to take the step. Adam, something you said about everybody going to university. Um, I think I agree with you. Something you said, you got a master's degree. Me as well, you know, several degrees. I've got a bachelor's, a, ba a master's degree and a teaching qualification. But when I look at it now, I don't use any of those. Yep. But I use some of the skills that I learned within there. And I think I could probably tell you it was a handful of skills that I learned from yep. education. But something you said there where you said everybody should go to university. Mm. What... What do you mean by that? Yeah, so for me, I have, and like yourself, I've been in this entrepreneur entrepreneurial life for the last seven years, maybe, uh, give or take, um, uh, on, on and off. So I have one of the biggest, I hire a lot. So we've got about 20 employees across the business, right? I am hiring every day. We're hiring agents at the moment and hiring managers and whatnot in the UK. And the biggest fall I felt is people not having the key skills of like, you know, writing an email, writing a report. Mm. Um, I'm not talking about getting a master's degree here. I'm not talking about becoming, if you want to become an astronaut, astro uh, sorry, let me say that again. <laughs> if you want to become an astronaut, um, you can go do a degree, you know, to be to work for NASA. You can become a dentist. You can do that. That's different. I'm talking about key skills and what you get in a degree. So like I, I'm good at writing, doing projects, um, putting, to be, putting together a report, you know, putting together a good email, good responses to email. That's where I learned in corporate and, 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 and at uni. And I've seen that people are missing that now because we're on this facade. I'm, I'm really, I'm unapologetically, I'm going to say this. People, everyone thinks they can be a, an entrepreneur. If they, everyone can be an entrepreneur, we would <laughs> won't have any work done. Honestly, we wouldn't have no employees who will actually do the work. So what's happening? People are coming into employment, coming with an entrepreneur mindset, which is fine. Do your side hustle, but go take the key skills that allows you to do the side hustle whilst mm -hmm. get the job to pay your bills. Otherwise, this is just just a, just a, just a it's just a fame thing, you know. You want to be cool, you want to be this. So, the point of that uni is it teaches you these key skills of communication and struggles, like the time pressure. Like I remember exam, exams. I was having three hour exams uh, from mechanical engineering, and I was now I look back and laugh at it, but it taught me how to structure myself, how to structure my answers, how to structure my time, how sure. to manage my time. There's a reason they give you three hours. In real life, you don't really need three hours, but allows you to be, you know, in life, you win and lose, and it teaches you all of that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've got a funny story about an exam. I remember we were doing a mock exam once. I think it was a, a practice exam in, in university. And one of the first things they say on the exam is read through all the questions mm -hmm. first, yeah? And our lecturer was actually just testing us here. And what he'd done is, for everybody that had read through the questions, the last page actually just said, you don't need to answer any questions. This is a test. Just sit here now and relax. Yeah. And you'd see everybody was pacing through it, pacing mm. through it, pacing through it. And he's watching everybody. And they clearly haven't followed the first instruction there, you know, yeah. which is once you get to the end page, this is just a test. Sit back mm. and relax. Mm. So it's a good point where you say exams are three hours for a reason. They're getting you prepped. They're seeing, can you follow skills? Yeah. Can you follow steps? Yeah. But Adam, do you feel that with the likes of AI and chat GPT and all of that right now, would people just turn around and say to you, well, Adam, I don't really need to go to university. I can get chat GPT to form an email for me. They can, it can write a report for me. It can do this nonsense that's, for that's me. That's the fair point because we use chat GPT in our business, right? And AI. Um, but but you're using it to enhance it, right? Correct. Yeah. And I agree, I agree with your point. But it, where else are you going to learn the time pressures? So you're, you're, in a, you're, you're working in a very good, good place here in, in, in Dubai, right? There are clients who, if you don't respond to them on time and if you don't respond, don't communicate well or don't deal yourself very well under pressure yeah you're going to lose that client and that could be 20 million dirhams right mm -hmm. right fact you've seen it and you can see it now i've seen it as well so that exam teaches you 
or it doesn't have to be exam. It could be a project or a dissertation. I've done a really good dissertation. That's uni. I'm not saying everyone needs to go to uni to just do the exam, but to learn the skills. Yeah. And then use AI to enhance it. So AI is a great, great tool, right? AI will help you be better than other people, right? But if you got this, the, the little bit of brains that you will learn or get the smartness or the skills, you will be 10 times better than a person who's just using AI on his own. Because mm, mm. if AI disappeared tomorrow, which is not going to, yeah, it's, not gonna, it's face here it. to stay. Yeah. But if it did disappear, people will have to, you know, yeah. result to manual kind of tasks of what you've learned in the past. Yeah. Well, AI is going to wipe out admin tasks for sure. Like, yeah. We're not going to need admin work, right? Which is fair. But yeah. So we need AI. AI is great. We're going to use it. We're going to implement it in our real estate company and our holiday homes company. Um, but I think. To summarize on the point of uni, I think people just need to take the, the soft skills and the behaviors that they need to learn and apply. One last point I have on this, the biggest thing I have learned living in this entrepreneur life and corporate life, fact, fact, 80% is behaviors and 20% is technical. Mm -hmm. Remember that 80% and 20%, right? So if you can remember everything we're doing in life, whether you're a state agent, whether you're uh, um, unless you're a dentist or a or a or an astronaut, I go back to that's very different, right? Doctor, dentist, that's very different. Other than that, you need to get eighty percent of your 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 stuff right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. So, Adam, before we move into talk more about Dubai, uh, let me ask you. You said you were working in a corporate role. At what point? Because let's say so. What you just said is it was a decent job. You know, mm. you're at uh, Jaguar Land Rover. They're flying you around the world. You got this great salary. At what point did you say to yourself, nah, man, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this nonsense no more. Because coming from a, an Asian family, I, c I can, you know, bet my bottom dollar that when you went off and told your pet, you know, your mother that you're leaving your corporate job, which was so good, she probably had a few words to say to you, you know, because yeah. every Asian kid, mm. when they're young, is told, go to university, get a good education, get married, have a couple of kids, have a fantastic career and your life will be sorted. Yeah. And here's you, you've I'm got everything <laughs> at 22, you've got this job, you've got everything that an Asian parent would want mm. and you're about to just kick it to the curb and say, I'm done. Yeah. Tell me, when was that decision made and, uh, and how was it? How did you say to yourself, I'm done? You know, I'm going to be very straightforward. I was like, I'm a very high risk taker. I have taken some massive, massive risk and 99% of them paid off because people, it's not as actually that high risk as your brain or your mind think because I do a lot of risk mitigation and everything. So in that point of my life at 26, 27, I just said, you know what? What's the worst going to happen? Honestly, I thought I was the smartest kid going. <laughs> I was high flying so good. I was like, I was so smart. I was like, even if I start a business, I'll just get... because. What happens, people who are listening to this, there are no corporate jobs, or if you, I was a consultant, basically, right? There are so many jobs in the market at that level because of the shortage of skills. Um, I was on LinkedIn, I was on Indeed.com, I, I was getting headhunted at that time, right? So again, trying to stay as humble as possible, but I was getting headhunted. I said, you know what, I can try for six months. That's what, but, but I have a very key point here. I did it, I started whilst I was in a job, so I got my first, first uh, holiday home rental. Uh, whilst I was in my job so I tested the waters not just gone straight into like sack my job and gone in that's one of the other things I say don't just sack your job don't sack your boss that's the worst line I've ever heard yeah I, I, you agree right experience that's experience James because like, you got the experience I've got 20, 21 year old men, mentee saying oh yeah I'm going to get rid of my boss I was like the boss is going to teach you more than I'll probably teach you in because he's like 50 years old yeah you know um, don't sack your boss. Do your side of sale. I did it on the weekend or in the evenings. You know, you can go get a property, call agents, um, you know, buy a property, get a mortgage on the side and then build your business up. And that's what I did. But I did it very quickly. I, I'm very, I want to be fast and it's life is fast. It's win or lose. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a single man and, and I've got the chance to do it. I don't have kids. So I'm like, you know, six months, try it. Left my job after six, eight months. Um, I think one year later, COVID happened. So <laughs> that, that wasn't great. But the risk, I just, my mindset was in one direction, laser focus. I didn't think I would lose. Mm. Do you think during COVID, they probably would have said to you, Adam, sorry, we haven't got a job for you anyway? No. No? no. You, were, you were protected <laughs> and safe? pretty good. I was okay. pretty good at okay. my job, yeah. No, because I was in a very good, uh, it's a highly skilled job. So uh, again, engineering, it's, okay. a, it's a high skilled career. So you don't really get rid of, unless you're, a, I, I was a permanent employee. So, you know, all the laws and stuff, they want just to make you redundant and all. So... For me, yeah, um, that was it. That was the that was the change. Like I said, you know what? I conquered the world. Mm. That's the drive. 
And I think people forget and, and you get it. You got to go all in in terms of the mindset. You have to go say like, I'm conquering the world. Otherwise, it's a, such a stressful entrepreneurship or even working as a property consultant or a broker or whatnot. It's a stressful thing. You're basically self-employed. Yeah. You got to make your end meets. Mm. Like, okay, me and you are making decent money now, right? Decent dollar, but... There are people you still got to put food on the table, especially if you're living in Dubai. <laughs> like you live in a nice area, I live in a nice area. What like I'm spending more than eight thousand pound a month. Yeah, and you got kids probably like a lot of money. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So I had to go all in and have that laser focus that I'm going to achieve, win or lose, win or lose, and I have to win. I'm only winning in life. I'm that's all I'm doing. Yeah, no, some good points there. Good points, man. And look, at the end of it, for anybody who's thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to drop out of university. Mm. Just remember, complete the university because you've got something you can fall back on because exactly. nobody can ever take your education away. Mm. Your assets can be taken away. You may you may lose your business. You may make some stupid mistakes where you put yourself in a situation where you lose everything. But one thing my mother used to say to me is, no. nobody can take your yeah. education from you and you can go and get a job and you're still highly employable. Yeah. So finish your education. And then if you want to mess about and do whatever you want to do, mm -hmm. explore ideas, mm -hmm. Go and do it. Mm -hmm. I think something else you said there, Adam, which was very, very good is don't sack your boss off. Yeah. And I remember with my first business, um, I absolutely hated my job at the time. You know, I was teaching. I went into teaching for a period of time, straight out of university, needed some money, hated it. So I had to find an avenue out. Mm. But I didn't I didn't just sack the job off. You know, I started a print firm next, yeah. like alongside it. And then I realized, Side yeah, month on month, I started thinking, shit, man, I'm making more mm -hmm. money here mm -hmm then I'm making with my job. And then when it got to a stage where I was making three or four times the amount of money that I was in my job, that's when I realized, actually, you know what? I need to park the job off now mm. and just concentrate fully. So mm. I'm 100% with you, man. If you are in a situation where you can keep your job, keep it for as long as you can mm. for two reasons. It's a safety net. Mm. It gives you the cash flow to start your business. Mm, exactly. And thirdly, like Adam just said, your boss is probably a lot older than you and you can pick up some good tips, tip, tricks and some, you know... Mentoring? He mentors absolutely. you? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, life coaching. I, yeah, I, I have a great point on this one, but you said about um, how, you know, your job your job was bad, your boss was bad or whatnot. If that happens, yeah, let's be real, right? Things, things are bad. It's really bad. You walk in and you're sad, you're crying, you know, you're feeling sad. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very real because I've had about seven, eight jobs. I worked in Boots. I worked in River Island. I worked in Topman. I work. I done all the the shop floor stuff as well. I worked in Royal Mail, sorting uh, Royal Mail, the post thing in the UK where you know you sort stuff. And you know the biggest thing I learned when the things are bad in the in the in your team or in your in your in your workplace, you pick up learning points from that. Why are they bad? Yeah. So is is the boss not treating the people correctly, or they don't have the processes, they don't have the systems, or they don't. They're hiring the wrong people. That's what the team culture is about. You pick that up and then you put that into your business now, which is what made me an entrepreneur and a leader because I'm not making those mistakes. Yeah. So anyone listening to this, the biggest point on this is look at your job status now. If you're hating it, look why you're hating it. Pick that up, turn that negative, say, okay, the X, Y, and Z, this is my point. My boss is bad because he doesn't treat me right. He doesn't speak to me properly because he doesn't have the right soft skills. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go learn the soft skill, get on a training course, uh, online or ask my company to give me the training course or learn these skills through James or through Adam or someone else and apply that into my side hustle. So my employees in the future don't have the same problem. Yeah, yeah. I think, look, ultimately, if you're not happy with yourself, you're not happy with your job, with the resources you've got today, with everything available to you today, you can change your situation so, so easily. Mm. You know, this morning in the gym, I'm listening to a podcast with uh, Stephen Bartlett and he's talking to the founder of Shopify. And the Shopify guy said to me, he goes, my mission in life is to create more entrepreneurs. Mm. And he goes, we can do that for the price of a couple of cups of coffee. Somebody can start a Shopify store today and you could be selling and earning money by the end of the week if mm. you've got the right product mm -hmm. or the right service. Mm -hmm. So I think like what you say, if your situation's bad, it doesn't have to stay like that, man. And it goes back to what, you, what, what we just talked about. Being raised in a council estate, you know, very similar situation. Single parent, similar situation. Most people could say, oh, you know what? I fucked up in life because it was only my yeah. mum raising me. I didn't have no yeah. father figure. We were poor. I didn't have this. That's bullshit, man. That's bullshit, yeah. Take a look at yourself in the mirror and you can change yourself if you want to change yourself. Mm. You know? Exactly. And that you hit the nail on the head. That's the driver. I said, I'm, I, you never see me complain. Okay, I'll have my bad days. Okay, I'm real. I have my bad days. But I'm like, okay, cool. I've lost this deal yesterday. I'm going to get another bigger deal. And that's what happened. I've got another client come to me with another bigger deal. But use the negative to drive you 
uh, to push you because it works. I don't believe in all of this. Oh, I need to, I don't believe in burnout. Like, I'm sorry. I don't believe in burnout. I, I work, the more I work, the less burnout I get. Like, yeah. you know, uh, there's no work-life balance fact. You can create one. You can put a label to it and you can say there's work-life balance. Very different if you have kids. You've got to give some time to kids. But like work-life balance, you choosing this lifestyle to 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 make 25 million or whatever your goal is, money or or freedom lifestyle, there is no work-life balance. Or go get a 95 job. There's nothing wrong with a 95 job, right? I have employees who are one of the, some of the best employees do 95 jobs in my company, mm. right? They don't work 95, but you know, it could be any hours, but set set hours. But there is, you've got to be ready for take away these labels of burnout, Work life, uh, work life balance. There's nothing such as work life balance. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like you just said, you know, earlier on, being a single man, not having children. I remember when I was single and I didn't have no children, no misses, no girlfriend to bother about. You know, those days were the best days in the sense for work because you you were just tunnel vision. Mm. You had your goals. You knew exactly what you were doing, and you could go out there and achieve it. You know, yeah. nothing could get in your way. Mm. I remember age of 28 walking into a Porsche garage buying a car for £110,000, you know. And back then, that was a big, big deal. Because you're from... Yeah, you know, you've come from an area where that shouldn't be happening to Mm. you, you know. There's no daddy's money going on here. This is raw cash that you've earned yourself. Mm. So I think, like you say, whilst you've got no family children commitments, there is no burnout. Like you say, man, just carry on going. There is no work-life balance. If you love what you do, man, it all integrates at once. And when people say you need a work-life balance, I think that's a load of bullshit. Well, they can have work-life balance, go work work in a good corporate job. I had a really great work-life balance when I worked in uh, Jaguar Land Rover. Perfect. But it doesn't satisfy me. So you gotta you gotta work out your vision. What is your goal? It does it does it satisfy you to have a work life balance? I would categorically tell you now, don't be an entrepreneur because it doesn't doesn't give mm. you work life balance. And 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 you can still have a good you can still have a work life balance. Let's go back to the title. Like I live in Dubai. How social am I? You see my Instagram, right? Mm. How social am I? I? But I still make money. So my social life is part of my lifestyle which generates me money because I created, because I was so tunnel vision that I'm going to meet clients when I'm out in a restaurant in Namos, right? I'm out in a restaurant in Salavi. You know, I, I'm, all my meetings are in this place. I'm part of private uh, clubs, private art clubs, you know, in DIFC and stuff. Like I go and spend time there whilst having a nice meal, whilst having a drink, right? Or having a cigar, you know, it's like, so mm. this is my recent thing for the last year and a half. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, yeah. go back to the bit where you said cigars. Yeah, yeah so, um, I'm sorry, I was going to say. Yeah, so I'm part of private clubs here, like, you know, so I mix I mix my social life with making money. So, you know, you can you can still drive this mindset where you don't have to stay in an office. You can you can join places where there's investors, people um, who are at your level, but still having a drink, still having a cigar. Like, you know, I'm part of a, a, a club in a, you know, capital club is called in, in the IFC. I go sit there, have a cigar and uh, have a drink, but I'll do my work. That's yeah. that's my that's my balance. But everyone's different. People have to understand you're different. For you, might be sitting on your own on your balcony, looking at the the whole Burj Khalifa view or whatnot. <laughs> you know, you got the fancy view, haven't yeah, you? <laughs> yeah, in a distance. <laughs> <laughs> well, everything's a Burj Khalifa view in Dubai. Um, so yeah, everyone's different. So so people have to work out what is your your driver. Not mm. just listen to our listen to me saying, oh, there's no work life balance. Yeah, your work life balance might be just eating food and then chilling, doing some work. You know, but for me, it's socializing. I'm, I, I, I'm more buzzing. Like I'm loving life, and I'm talking to people. I just, I just love it. Mm. So, Adam, um, you know, we can talk for ages. So, yeah. but we need to move this along. Yeah, dude, tell me in the UK when you started the Airbnb stuff. Mm-hmm. I call it the Airbnb stuff because whenever I think about holiday lets, the first person that comes to my mind is you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because Thanks. you were so fresh with it. When you started it, it was all very new. I remember the platforms being all very new. Mm. You know, I, horror stories of properties getting wrecked. Mm. But you got such a great business model on how you did it in the UK. Tell the listeners how you started and how quickly you scaled it into this monster. Yeah, so I keep the story short. So 2018, the company was set up uh, for holiday rentals, uh, a service accommodation call in the UK. Um, and then from there, COVID happened, slowed our business down. We went from one or two properties, 30 very quickly. COVID happened, reduced the business a little bit. When COVID happened, I decided, again, same mindset. We talked about it in the old podcast. Bad things will turn into good things if you if you want to. So what did I do in COVID? Moved to Dubai, 
uh, set up a business here, set up a trade license here, registered with DTCM, everything. 2021, yeah, two thousand just to end of 2020, 2021. Um, that gave that grew us massive. So you know the leverage of two two offices, one in Dubai, one in the UK. We've got over 123 properties now across the. I think before we get to the Dubai stage, you've missed a big chunk out here. I think in the UK because look, first of all, tell the listeners what is a holiday let for people that don't know. So holiday lets is where you take a property instead of renting it for 12 months to a tenant, you rent it on either nightly basis or weekly basis or monthly basis and generating higher income up to 20 to 30 percent than you would with a 12 month tenancy. And you get a good property management company to manage all of that, to make that happen, marketing, cleaning, um, the software, the systems that go behind it, the checks and the security and the property management company is us. That's what I did. And that's how I grew to 120 plus properties. In the UK? Uh, including Dubai. Including Dubai. Yeah. Okay. And I think you've just been too humble with that story, <laughs> man, because there's a lot more to this. Because I remember you were at the forefront of setting up systems. You were at the forefront of setting up processes. Yeah. I remember you being one of the first people that had his own cleaning crew. Yeah. You had oh. your own channel, you know, your channel um, plugins, manager, channel all the manager, software. Yeah. Just give me a quick, before we get onto Dubai, just give them a quick recap on, on what kind of size this was. Because I remember, you know, you had professional photo shoots going on of your places. Mm. Your places looked top notch, you mm. know, when you looked at the website. I think you've just been too humble, man. You yeah. just skipped the load out and gone straight <laughs> yeah, to Dubai. Yeah, so much have happened. Like, I've actually forgotten about that. So I'm the systems guru. Like, I, when I teach my mentees and stuff, I teach about systems processes. Again, comes from my corporate life. Everything is relatable, as you can see the pattern now, right? Everything I learned systems and processes and implemented it like you said we have like channel managers we have pricing con pricing software we have processes for everything behind each things that we do check-ins checkouts how security works uh, how employees work disciplinary procedures everything is all done like a proper corporate business whilst people have the freedom so i did that from day set day one you know perfect photography i had my own cleaning company i still have one like i have my crew inside so everyone works for us only, so we don't get outside cleaners, we don't get outside, uh, you know, help. So I said this up from the start, it's been the key to my success to grow so substantially so quickly. Mm -hmm. So Adam, at what point did you think to yourself, um, you didn't think to yourself that you had enough of the UK, did you? No, like I'm, I did. I'm <laughs> not, yeah, so this is another thing. I'm, I don't know, I think I must be the most positive person going. Mm. <laughs> like I was like, okay, cool. Let it, let it, let it run. Not going to lie. It wasn't the greatest. We lost a lot of money, but we let it run because it created leverage. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in a business buying, leveraging my group and stuff. I'm in a different situation because if I had closed this business, I would given up on it in the UK. I wouldn't have the banking finances now, the backing of banks. Like, you know, the, when the business gets older, you get better lending, you get all of this and you grow your business further. So no, so I didn't have enough of it because I, I know I knew where I was heading. Mm. So let it float sometime. Everything was closed, right? In COVID. So I had to let it float. Um, so yeah. I, I I came to Dubai after that just to just to just to grow myself and explore other opportunities. I remember during COVID time when um, you know Airbnb took a big hit. I think you were one of the only people I remember on social media who was actually quite honest, a bit like myself. You were talking about the disasters as well. Yeah. Everybody talks about, oh, you know what? I got a three month booking. I made twelve thousand pounds. I'm yeah. rich. I'm going to retire. That did you know, <laughs> and you were. I remember this post clearly. Actually, you yeah. posted your calendar. Yeah. Where it was just empty, yeah, yeah, you know, compared to where it was previously, yeah. and you know, this was across multiple properties. This mm. wasn't just one property. Yeah. You showed the world that shit. You know, I've gone from I'm losing several thousands of pounds mm. here, hundreds of thousands of pounds when you combined it all together. Just quickly before we hit to buy, would you say, Adam, that on social media, people portray a picture that they want people to see, and of course, yeah. people are not too honest. Yeah, of course, people do that uh, for whatever reason. You know, social media is another category of uh, people getting validation and all of that. Yes, they do it. Um, and I can't, I won't sit here and lie, but you know, some part as a human, there's a part of us that wants the validation. They wants to show the successes. There's nothing wrong with showing successes, but I think we should be showing our, you know, the negatives or the, or the, the things that we lost in and we learned from. So mm -hmm. the post you're talking about, I've got, I think I've got two posts. One actually on, it's on Instagram and Facebook. People scroll back to 2021. It actually says how much I lost yeah. and what happened and probably one of the most liked posts. And 
And I remember taking that picture in a coffee shop because I was just sitting on my laptop doing nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I actually, but then I couldn't see the world out at that time. Um, but the thing was the best thing that happened to me. COVID has made me what I am. It's the reason I have a nice car. It's the reason I live in Dubai. Mm -hmm. I, I really, like, I, I know it's been horrible things that happen to people, but COVID was like, man, this is the opportunity. Financial crisis, you've been through one before, um, more than me. And I luckily, I read a lot. I've been around right people like yourself and other people. This was, that was the time. And here I am, I have the, the big, one of the biggest companies in the UK uh, and then now trying to become one of the biggest in Dubai as well. So yeah, it was really hard. It was the toughest times of my life. Yeah, because look, I know me and you have conversations about social media, you know, off the record, off the podcast. And me and Adam have often said that, you know, like, okay, you see pictures of us in Dubai having a great time. Yeah, we we are time. having a great time, yeah. don't get me wrong. But behind the scenes, like Adam said earlier, £8,000 to live here a month, that's a lot of money. Yeah. And sometimes we talk about this, we say to each other, you know, if you're not earning here, you can't stay here because this country can we'll very quickly you chew in. you up and <laughs> spit you out, you know. So we're very, very honest on socials, man. I want people to see everything. You'll see pictures of my children on there. You'll see me out on the weekend. Then you'll see the nice stuff as well. And I think anybody listening, you should always take social media with a pinch of salt because it's it's a visual channel, you know. Mm, Instagram is mm, visual. Mm. People want to show you nice stuff. Mm. And especially the people that want to try and sell you something, yeah. they're going to show you that extra nice stuff, mm -hmm. you know, so they can get you hooked. But I think what Adam said earlier as well, just keep yourself focused on what you're doing. Mm. And I think it's very important to stay in your own lane. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Blank out the noise and just go where you're going. Well, yeah, great, great point you touched on there. So in Dubai, everyone's trying to win or winning. Like, you know, you've got a lot of millionaires and billionaires. And like, let's look at real estate, the agents, someone closing 50 million, 150 million or 200 million deals, right? Yeah. You can easily sit here and be like, oh, I just only closed the 5 million. Oh, I'm gonna no, you can't because if you, if you just focus on yourself, like you said, that 5 million will eventually become the 150 million because you, you're growing and you're learning rather than comparing on social media or comparing just just... Like I don't compare to any other, other agents. It's tough. Like let's again be real. It's tough. I think, oh, why didn't I close the 150? Why mm -hmm. don't I have the lead, right? Then I go back to the drawing board. I was like, I don't have the lead because of this or this reason because I haven't done X, Y, and Z. And that guy is been here 11 years, right? Yeah. There's like people got to take a step back, and then I'm like, oh, pretty pretty blessed, you know? Yeah. But I'm working hard, laser focused. A great point. Laser focused. Stay in your lane. Yeah, I think what you said is very, you have to be relative as well. If you've seen someone close a deal for 150 million, he's been doing it for 12 mm -hmm. years and you've been here for a year, yeah. you know, you, you can't be too hard on yourself mm. in that sense. But when I look around at our sales force, sales force uh, on, on the floor where I am, the people that are closing are the people that are consistently doing something repetitive mm. all the time. You know, the discipline is there. They're doing it. They're doing it. You don't see none of this nonsense. I'm working from home. Yeah. Because when someone's working from home, I don't care who you are. Yeah, you're not working. You're not working from home. <laughs> you're chilling. You know, you might do some work, mm. but then Netflix kicks in. Your lunch mm. kicks in. Things kick in. Your kids run up to you. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um. But the guys that are laser focused, and every month you're seeing the 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 numbers on the board higher and higher and higher. Same names appearing. Same yeah. names appearing. They're the people you want to be speaking to. They're the people you want to be having lunch with. They're mm. the people whose brain you want to be picking as a broker. Yeah. And, you know, what are they doing? How can you take that formula, adapt it to yourself and make it work for yourself? Yeah, yeah. And and like the point, one last point on that is um, if you want to be like these people, if you're seeing this on social media, try to emulate how they're behaving, how they work, how they're disciplined, uh, they, what they measure. So measure your, measure your success, measure what you're failing at, measure what you're winning at. Measure it every week as, as an objective, as a goal. So I think that's the key skill. A lot of things are like, people get, people, I hear this word, I'm like, you know, it's too much is happening. I'm confused, overwhelmed. Yeah, you are because you're not measuring what you're doing and you're trying to see other people's success, which is, should be driving you and saying, okay, cool, let's go have a coffee with this guy. Ask, you know, uh, if I want to learn something, I'll come and call you, which I have. I've been through my downs, ups and downs through COVID and I've called you. I said, give me some advice because you've been through, like I've lost like business partners and had yeah. drama and you're aware of that and i called you up i called you and one of the guy up and like you do that like you know and use these type of other, other people who are successful or doing very well to guide you to get to your position rather than compare mm -hmm. good point there you got to measure stuff how can you improve something if you don't measure yeah. it you know it's um it's simple facts if you don't look at your kpis if you're not looking at your numbers yeah. it's simple if you've made a hundred calls 
How many leads have you got? Yeah. You know, and how many have converted? Yeah. You've got a percentage there. Yeah, what gets measured gets done. Exactly. That's it. Exactly. Uh, and it's simple as that. I'm very high on KPIs in my team. Literally, I have a weekly meeting uh, with my team at different levels. I have a monthly meeting and it's all driven through exact KPI and it's red, red green and amber and, and it's got different different titles, different things like people, um, you know, occupancy rates, um, how much money we made, how much money we didn't make, you know, all of that. So if people miss this, again, taking back comes from the corporate life and the training that £150,000 Jaggy Landro spent on me. Wow. Wow. Good points. Adam, we're in Dubai. Yeah. Oh, finally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're in Dubai. Um, I think you came out probably about, I think, six months, a year before me. Yeah, I came out in COVID, right? So yeah, it was just, yeah. just middle of the COVID, yeah. Now, we touched on the um, on the kind of short-term holiday let business. I know your business has gone on way more than just that. Mm -hmm. But can you explain to people that when you get to Dubai and you try to do a holiday let business here, how different it is from the UK? Because mm. there's certain things, because I have people reach out to me all the time that say, James, I want to buy an apartment out here. I want to do Airbnb. I'm like, okay, number one, you got to have some money to buy this apartment, you know? <laughs> and then there's various other factors that I'll let you talk about because it's what you do. Mm. But tell me how your model has changed when you came to Dubai compared to the UK. Yeah, I'm going to very keep it very simple because this country is very regulated. Um, everything is regulated by the government or an authority. So let's take holiday homes, as you said, holiday lets. In the UK, there's no regulations, right? You can go buy a property or rent a property of another company on a commercial let and uh, just put it on Airbnb. Here you do that, you'll hit, get hit with a fine. First of all, you won't even be able to get in one of the in the buildings because mm. the security will stop you, say, what the hell are you doing? Like, it's that strict here. So for, for me, the biggest change was learning about regulation, learning about how to be within a process of a regulatory framework, right? So when I came here, I learned a lot about that and I implemented some of the learnings from here to the back to the UK. I do a lot of lesson learned. So the biggest change here is you have to have a license First of all, in the UK, it cost you 12 quid. Here, it cost you about <laughs> eight grand pounds. <laughs> yeah. So you get your visa and everything. Then you have to apply for a permit for each property. Um, and it needs to be done by a professional company. So you cannot just go as an individual and just have loads of properties. So, you know, all in all, you're spending about 10,000 pounds just to start a company and have all the, all the little things set up. You need to have an office. You know, you need to be operating in mainland. So all of these people thinking, you know, just set up a free zone company. No, it doesn't work like that. I'm I'm very open. I can sit here and where it's a very transparent, you know, podcast. Like I could give advice and say, yeah, come to Dubai, you know, invest in property, do this, you know, got to have the funds and got to have the knowledge and got to have the right people on the ground here. Mm -hmm. So what's the vision with the holiday company here in Dubai? So for us, um, I think we've grown enough, which is great. You know, I don't have a number on it, like how many properties we want. So I'm currently, as, a, as an individual, I'm buying companies and mergers and acquisitions. So we just recently purchased a company in Dubai, a small re boutique real estate company. Mm -hmm. um, so we're doing brokerage now, sales and leasing. Our goal is now, because it's combined to, to holiday lates and brokerage sales and leasing combined together. When we sell apartments with our investors, we're providing a full service where you buy an apartment as an investor, you put it into holiday less through our company and we'll manage everything, maintenance, cleaning, leasing, and the sales process and the resale if you ever want to resell it. And it's all in hand with us and you can be living in the UK. It's yeah. simple as that. That was a vision and it's coming true as you can see. You know, finally we got the transfer of the license from the last shareholders, bought the company and uh, we made our first sale last week. So pretty good. Yeah, no, I like what you're doing though. I mean, it's a full complete turnkey solution. Mm. And I think similar with myself, I think that's why I'm seeing a larger influx of UK people through my network that are mm. now buying in Dubai mm -hmm. because they have somebody they can trust. You know, mm. someone who's got a proven track record in real estate mm -hmm. in the UK, built my own portfolio, understand how construction works, understand what it's mm. like to have an investment. When you can offer them everything and you make it Full easy, set, yeah. And I always say, when you're starting a business, if you solve somebody's problem, mm -hmm. you know, they're going to stay with you or mm. they're going to buy from you mm -hmm. if you can solve a problem. Yeah. And I think that's what you guys are doing here. Mm -hmm. So the real estate company, how did you acquire this? Because it all happened very, very quickly. From what I saw, uh, D was out here. Um, yeah. We'll get him on the podcast when he's out <laughs> here soon, <laughs> yeah. wherever he is in the world right now. Yeah. But it all happened so, so quickly. I knew, I knew you guys, you mentioned you were working on something, yeah. but I just saw a post on it. I was like, wow. Where yeah. did this come from? Yeah, so we kept it a bit quiet for for various reasons, legal reasons. And, you know, we weren't sure if it was going to go through. We had some issues with the, the previous buyers, sellers to 
price and negotiations and all that. You'd be surprised. It took us nearly five, four months for the whole thing to go through and even get our transfer of the license. This literally happened about two weeks ago, right? So officially. And that is slow for Dubai because things happen quick here. Yeah, but there's there's a lot of bureaucracy or admin and all of this paperwork. And, you know, and it's a bit different on a sale because so, there's like timing periods they have. So any sale in the in the UK, if a business gets sold, they are like, you know, they go in the newspaper and, and all of this type of stuff. So so how it happened was, um, you know, we're doing a lot of lead gen. I'm doing a lot of lead gen in the UK, so I buy businesses. Sure. Um, so, you know, lead gen, just like you go for a property, you do a lot of lead generation to offer businesses to buy out, buy them out for a certain figure or whatnot. So I won't go too much into that, but here was because of my connection. So I knew someone that knew someone and I have told people, like we always, we always say, tell people what you do or what you want to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I want to be, I want to be on a spaceship and I'll tell people I want to go to the moon. Right. I would eventually let, get there. Right. So this is the mentality I always use. So I said, I want to buy a real estate company. I'm not going to start one. I'm going to buy an existing company. Right. Because he has a structure. He has the reputation, the credibility and the time and the experience. Right. So this is a 2016 um, company, I think, or 17. So, yeah, one of the connections came through and said, look, yeah, I have a guy who's selling. He has a small, very small company. Um, potential to grow, potential to improve, employ people. And from there, that was last year in October, I think, November. But I was, as you know, I like traveling. So I was in Bali for a month and a half, mm. messing around, like, you know, just, just chilling, <laughs> sitting on the, on the beach, which probably actually took me back a little bit. I was like, no, I need to work now and I enjoy working. Sure. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, that came through. Um, me and D have been business partners of the things and, you know, we were been friends for a long time. So, we partnered together on this on on this purchase of this acquisition of this company, and uh, here we are. And then we just 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 went with it. So now we're hiring agents, uh, real estate agents, and you know everything is basically so it's a, it's a, it's an improvement of a business and you know, making it better. Sure, sure. And um, just for the listeners, what was the how was the company before you took it over? How was how was the company as in running? Was so it, was it's it? a boutique investment company. So there's two owners. Um, they were they had like three or four employees, maybe four I think, and not great. They were just doing deals, um, small office. So we said, you know, we can, you know, keep one on one person or two people and put our own mark on it. Sure. So sure. it was a very small company, but you know they've done multiple deals or whatnot. But it was for this, you know, when they work with your own investors, they they weren't doing much marketing. They're not doing any ads. You know, said, look, there's an opportunity here, guys. You're wasting your company here, and they wanted to exit because they they had a dispute or whatnot. So, so this is what we did. Now we're going to turn it into over 50 agents by end of this year. Our goal is to bill five million dirhams by end of this year per month. Excellent. Per month. I'm I'm very confident you guys will get. We there. will. Well, I've just uh, I've just closed. Um, well, going through the close of 10 million dirham sales, and I only got my broker license two weeks ago. Wow. 10 million. And because from connections, I've got bulk units on sale. I've got uh, just sold two in Dubai Hills. So, you mm. know, it's doable. It's like you you got to really think the big numbers. I only think big numbers now. Honestly, I'm not thinking small numbers. We are in this business to do big deals, not the 500 pound deals, not the 550,000 dirham I, deals. I don't think you have 500 pound deals here in Dubai. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> so... <coughs> Oh, sorry, that's okay man so now with the with the real estate company here um and yeah you know, i know obviously i'm working real estate myself yeah. so adam how how important would you say or how many of your sales are coming through your network yeah so this is so important networking is key networking is your net worth as you know this mm -hmm. right so my sales so the last the, the bulk deal in in in, in shoba uh, you know you're an expert in shoba um, came from a network uh, on Instagram. Uh, my other two in Dubai Hills, one came from our holiday homes because the guy, we built up a really good relationship over the past year and he wanted to sell through us. Um, another one came through Instagram and another one came through someone that I know in Dubai. So over 10 million dirhams of sales in the last two weeks are through my network, just through my network. Mm. And this is, as you know, working in a, in, a, in a good environment in real estate at the moment, it's all networks and who you know and how much, customer service you have provided over your lifetime or your time with this person who yeah. will end up selling the 50 million dirham villa yeah no i agree with you i mean look i'm not i'm not dissing the old techniques of what people do here you know i call it cash calling i won't mm. call it the you mm. know cold calling but mm. still it, it still hap it happens a lot mm. everybody's doing it yeah. data is so easily available yeah. here 
somebody will email you from Pakistan or India say, you know, I've got the whole list of this block. Mm. And you look at it and you compare it to some of the data you might be holding of genuine clients. And you think, how have they got this? Because mm. in the UK, this nonsense don't happen. Mm. You know, GDPR will kick in. Mm. But it still works for people. But for me, I feel like yourself. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is through network. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is through brand credibility. Correct. A lot of it is through social posts. And people say to me, oh, James, you spend... Like, for instance, this podcast. People say, this takes up a lot of time. It takes up a lot of investment, yeah. money to get things edited afterwards and to continuously do it. But why do I do it? Number one, it's a little bit selfish because I get to speak to great people, yeah? So I can sit and have a conversation mm -hmm. When really I should be out there doing some networking, but I like this. I like mm. to talk to people. Mm. And number two, it's a great lead gen. Yeah. It's a really, really good lead gen because people think, actually, you know what? I heard this. Mm. Let me call this guy up. Mm. So for me, just like yourself, I think networking, social posts, mm. being out there speaking mm. to people, I think there's a whole new way to generate business in real 100%. estate. 100%. I think I only know a few handful of people who are so consistent in social media post or or, 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 or activity on social media. It's you and myself, right? Yeah. I have my own social media manager that runs around and records stuff. Like I've got him on payroll, right? Yeah. For a reason. For yeah. that reason, just explain. You have, you do the same, right? You have your posting. I think I see your post every other day. It yeah. takes a lot of work. Like it's like acting, right? You know, sitting there in a, in, a, in, a, in a studio, you're going out there, retake after retake. Like sometimes I have to retake about 10 times because I'm just tired and, you know, I'm thinking I want to make that deal. I want to grow that business. But what you said is so important because you have to do this to get reach to the global market. It's a TV in your pocket. Yeah, yeah. That's and, it. and the fact is it's free. Yeah, very good point. In fact, it's free. You know, go back 20 years and you were putting a TV advert on on a radio advert and how much are you spending on it? And now you can be your own TV channel. Yeah. You could be your own radio station like we're here yeah. at the moment. And I don't understand why so many people don't kind of jump onto this yeah. or grasp this because it's commitment. It's mm. discipline. discipline. You've got to keep doing it again and again and again. Well, that's what I've learned. Honestly, I have a set date. I have to do this. I have an agenda and it's, it's discipline. And some days I've had, I'm like, I'm not, I'm, not an, I'm not a guy who sits in front of a camera. I've never been. I've been an engineer. I've been in real estate, right? But you, it's discipline. You want to do things that you don't want to do. Yeah. That's what makes you money. So, right, you know, you want to do things when you don't feel like it. Honestly, like, I don't feel like sometimes turning up in front of a camera. I'm like, oh, my hair's too long. Oh, I've not got my beard done, you know. But you could turn up, like, turn up and just do that. And that post will sell your, <laughs> yeah. the Mac Lagoons or, uh, or, or your Shoba, you know. that, that would sell. I mean, un unlike you, Rav, I don't really care what I look like. If my hair's a mess, <laughs> if my beard's a mess, I'm still putting a social post out there. But yes. getting back to the social media side of things, you know, I'll give the, the listeners an example. For me, all of my sales have come through social media. Yeah. They've come all through my network or through recommendations. I remember one of my first sales in this country. It was through a social media post where somebody was following me, had been following me for a while, looking at what I'm doing in the UK, trusted me, asked me a few questions. And I honestly thought the guy was just wasting my time, you know, and more for me for thinking that at the time. But I soon realized, hold on a second, this guy was having several touch points. Okay, let me see what this guy's like at responding, this and that. I remember when the Mac Lagoons, one of the clusters was released and he was here in Dubai and he goes to me, James, I want to buy. Mm, I want to buy. Mm. I'm like, okay. Uh, I explained the whole process to him. Picked him up. We went to the launch in the Coca-Cola arena. I still remember this. And I'm a new broker, bro. This is a few weeks yeah, out of training. I've seen this. I've seen all of these things you've done. You know, I went to this place. I didn't know what an, an expression of interest was. Mm. I didn't know mm -hmm. where the money had to be paid. I didn't even know how the process worked. All I did was rock up in a suit, look as confident as hell, mm -hmm. walked in, you know, with my presence. And we and this guy bought a unit. And off of that, you know, I'm quite, quite happy to say I earned nearly 20,000 UK pounds off mm -hmm. of that one yeah. deal. You know, and you think to yourself, damn, that was easy. But yeah. when you sit back easy. and you think, no, it wasn't it was easy, easy because all of the years of commitment on social media... Yeah led to that yeah yeah but the fact that somebody trusted me for a social post yeah. to spend nearly six hundred thousand yeah. uk pounds yeah with me yeah just through social media so it goes to show yeah. the credibility that is out there that you can form it's, social media is so powerful like i've got celebrities dming me 
right? And yeah. it's it's and I was like, oh, this gotta be a fake account. It's not. <laughs> it's like you go there and I'm like, I'm speaking to my social media guy. He was like, Yeah, it's gonna happen, Adam. Just keep consistent. Keep consistent. It's gonna happen. Like I'm talking someone wants to invest two million dollars, three million dollars. And I wasn't believing in myself, but luckily, because I've had enough experience now to more change my mindset and believe bigger. One of the other things you just said, why your deal happened for that 20K. It's because what I said earlier, the 80% of behaviors and 20% are technical. You don't need to know what EOI is, right? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know. <laughs> I think I probably found out like three weeks ago. Yeah. I don't care. I don't care what the bro other broker thinks. I don't know. I'm an owner of a company. I will I will have experts like, you know, this. you own companies. Experts will know this. Or you pick up a phone and you ring up DLD and say, how do I get a broker card? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can, that should be the least of your worries. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. or you get an admin person, or you get a, you get you get whatever the people who have been here who do this. And I said, okay, cool. I'm going to concentrate on selling similar to you that three million dirhams deal, four million dirhams. I was building that relationship of the eighty percent soft behaviors. In the meantime, a company purchase was going through for the acquisition of this of this real estate company. Yeah. And when I got the broker card, because I was the I'm the first broker of the company, really officially, you know, I said, okay, cool. I'm going to close the deal now. But that wasn't the hardest bit. EOIs and all of these uh, acronyms that you see, that's not the hard bit. Mm. It's, it's, the, it's all the work that's gone in previously. Yeah. Now you're seeing the fruits of it. Yeah. You know, and it's happening. I'm finding it's happening time and time again. Okay, some people won't buy, of but course, the fact of the game. that they've come through social media, the fact that they've flown to Dubai, mm. they've spent money, they've made a commitment, mm. they've come to see you, they've spent time with you. So I think, yeah, man, I for me... If I'm honest, I'm going to be focusing purely on social media as yeah. lead gen because I don't. I think it's the most powerful and underrated thing that is out there at the moment. Again, and it's only going to get better with AI, like we touched on it. You know, yeah. when AI integrates with all the social media stuff, you, you can write your post through an AI now. Like, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's Why that are people not understanding that? Yeah. You don't even have to think anymore. Yeah. So, yeah, me and you are, I think we're doing well with the social media and I think we're going to keep growing. And I want to inspire the people through our, like, People follow between us. I think we have like 20,000 followers. And like, you know, if we post, it reaches a lot of people. That and you and let's, for the record, those are genuine people that yeah. follow us for yeah, the get, reasons of the content we put out. Yeah. There's no paid, there's no bought followers here or any yeah, nonsense like that. It's yeah. people that have come onto your profile, like what you do and followed you. Yeah. And then they eventually, you know, it's not about selling. It's about providing a customer service and a customer journey. That's what we focus on. And I've seen you focus on that as well. The customer journey, the stories they see, they see how we doing the deal with this other customer, you know, how things are happening. And that's what people buy into. Yeah, yeah, and no, I agree. So Adam, before I wrap this up, I've got a few questions for you that I want to ask you, yeah? Just um, mm. one of them is, if you had to pick one of the, you know, one of the most, a, a project or one of your biggest accomplishments to date that you're most proud of, what would it be? For me, it's very simple. In the business world, we signed a deal with a developer in Birmingham. We're one of the biggest now in Birmingham because we have an exclusive deal with one of the biggest developers of the five-star apartments. Is that the one with all the uh, cinema, pool tables? Yeah. Cinema? Okay, yeah, like the Dubai Life. So I bought, we bought Dubai Life into Birmingham. Go check it out on his <laughs> IG. You need to see that. Yeah, yeah, that it's great. We, um, you know, we all it's great. It's like the 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 Dubai type of you know the lobbies and the and the the views and. And we did that deal, and we're exclusive. No one else is allowed to work with the with the, with that with that developer other than us. And we we hold presence there, and that was my biggest achievement. Wow! And I, you know what? I bet you uh, rubbed a lot of people up the wrong way because where you are in Birmingham, yeah, I know there's a few people. In fact, there's a few people, a couple of people who have been on the podcast in season one in the UK that claim to be the biggest out mm. there, but. If you can't go and get an exclusive building like that, I'm sorry, mm. you ain't the biggest. Exactly, yeah. Well, I'm not going to say I'm the biggest, you know, there are the bigger players, which I'm learning from them, right? But from wh how quick we've did it, um, I, I think I'm very proud of that. Adam, if you could go back in time and change one thing about your career or your professional journey, what would it be? Again, very simple. Um, I would put myself in position with people like yourself or people who are 10 years older than me. Like I'll put a number to it because the things that you learn is incredible. Like I, I've, I've got a meeting after this with a guy who's 54 years old, right? It's actually not boring to hang out with someone 54 years old. They're actually probably more funnier. They got more jokes um, and the, the knowledge they have, the <laughs> connections they have is incredible. The biggest thing I see um, people, whatever age, like my age or 20s, uh, late 20s, they're hanging out with the same people at the same age group. I'm sorry, but not. 
my I've, I've only got one best friend left from my group for the last 10 years that's still in touch with me i don't talk to anyone else fact i'm not being rude i'm not being nasty what you adding to my life like i i don't go on many podcasts i choose podcasts to go on because you're not you gotta give me something it's a transactional world i'm sorry yeah. we can we can lie to each other we can put labels on again we're in a labeled world we're in a transactional world if i'm buying you dinner i'm learning from you that's why i'm buying you dinner it's fact right yeah. uh, we need to we need to understand that um, we should be sitting in groups and peer groups who are doing 10 times better than us 10x your life yeah and if i could do that earlier i think I would have been I would have been sitting with Richard Branson right now. Yeah. Yeah. I think um you know like like you said that Adam I think um it's very very important the circle you surround yourself with. Yeah, when you're in your teens and your 20s you can get away with hanging around with some people that mm. might not uplift you but as you get older like you said as well you've got one friend left, mm. you know. With me on my hand I can count who my best mates are and I'm not going to get past my third finger. Mm. You know, people that you can pick up the phone to and rely mm. on. And I think it's very important if you're if you're the cleverest person in your group, yeah. man, you need to step outside that group and go yeah. somewhere and find a new group mm. where people are going to uplift you. Mm. Agreed. Yeah. And and it's, it's hard. Don't get me wrong. People think, oh, it's rude. You know, I'm letting my friends go. Just but you have a mission. If you're clear on your values and principle, you have a mission. You're going to have to cut them. I go, go have a cup of coffee when you like you don't want to do something. You want to have a downtime. But it's, I even that actually I struggle with because when I'm having a conversation, I'm not having these conversations over a cup of coffee. And I'm like, mm. what am I doing here? Like, okay. Um, it, do, you, do you almost feel like when you, you know, when you're having a meaningless conversation, when I'm there and you know, when you're just false pretenses, you're in a, you might be with some family members mm. even. And in my brain, I'm thinking, why the fuck am I here? Yeah. My brain's saying to me, this guy is talking about how much he hates his wife. Yeah. This negative. guy is talking about how he hates his, his life. <laughs> and I'm saying, all I'm thinking in my head is thinking, okay, what am I going to post for my next social media strategy? Yeah. Or how am I going to get my next deal? I've got this person to contact. I've got this person yeah. to contact. And I remember very early on, I used to get frustrated at my wife when she used to make me go to these events. Yeah. And it got to the point where I just, I'd go there and have more fun talking to a child who was six years old, mm. who's got an imagination and he's saying how he's, he's going to create a flying <laughs> car that can go in and out of water. And you're thinking, <laughs> I'm having more of an intelligent conversation with this guy than I'm having with this guy who's so stuck. Yeah. You know, he can't get out of his own negative thinking. Mindset is, that's the difference between us and some of the other people. Mindset is so key. The biggest change I did was my mindset in the corporate world. I said, I'm changing my mindset. And it was a guy who actually helped me. I'm not going to mention his name. We did this thing in the, in, in, Again, it goes back to training is so important. In Jaguar Lander, where they did this thing for health and safety, they said you need to change your mind to be able to have less injuries and less time off work. And this, they've spent so much money of bringing mindset change rather than saying, follow this process or wow. don't do this. They bought mindset change. They, they spent so much money. I ended up finding it so fascinating, which was part of the start of my journey actually into business. I said, oh, if I apply this to the rest of my life of not hating people, of not saying, oh, my car's shit or... or I don't know, but everything is negative. No, and they use that to drive positive behavior. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've spoke a lot about Jaguar Land Rover. I mean, this this podcast is not sponsored by them, but if you <laughs> if you fancy giving us a couple of cars, that'd be quite nice, actually. <laughs> yeah. They were they were um, employ employment is good um, has been good for me um, provided a lot of benefits. I still talk to my uh, colleagues, but they're doing great. Some of them are 150k, 200k pounds yeah. a year with, and you get a you get a brand new Range Range Rover or a Jaguar every six months. Wow. Right? Wow. So imagine imagine that everyone that was my dream. That was my dream. When I got my first car key, it was like a brand new car. Never bought a brand new car. Yeah. Like, yeah, I buy nice cars now. But then and that I I still wanna I was, I was thinking about this like a couple of days ago actually. When I go back to England, I'm gonna go take my uh, ex boss out for a drink. Yeah. You know, I'm proud to say what I've done and he believed in me when I was at work and he always said, you know, I will excel, I would do this. And he was, if he didn't believe, he's 56, 55, something comes in yeah, older. Yeah. And I'm going to, I want to go see him. I'm just excited. I want to say, look, how are you guys doing? I miss work. I yeah. really do sometimes. <laughs> well, Adam, you know what? It's been a great podcast, man. I'm going to wrap it up shortly. But um, for anybody listening out there, Adam, what's one piece of advice you can give to someone who's starting out in this field right now in real estate? Or if there's somebody there in the UK thinking, you know what? I want to come to Dubai. I want a piece of this action. What's your one piece of advice you could give them? For me, um, discipline. Work so hard that you outwork the rest of the people around you, right? Work so hard that you're not comparing yourself to your peer group. You're comparing yourself to, again, I'm going to use you because you're sitting here comparing myself to you and not in such a compare, but I'm like, 
look, you know, I'm going to learn from him and I'm going to outwork everyone around me. That's my motto. I actually genuinely fucking believe that I will outwork everyone around me. Mm. Right. I have my downtime, but stop believing in, oh, there's a work-life balance. Stop believing in, I need rest time. I know I'm being stream here, but like, that's why I'm sitting here and that's what I'm doing. Um, you're competing. You don't get, not everyone gets a, a medal in, in real life. In school in England, everyone gets a medal, either you live, whether you win or lose. Yeah. Here, I'm sorry, but when you're going to close a deal, again, you know this. <laughs> if someone at an agent does a better job than you, you're not getting a, a, a free medal. Say, oh, thanks for turning up, James. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's be ready. Cutthroat industry. Yeah. So remember, cutthroat industry, get yourself trained up to be cutthroat. I'm in very cutthroat position. I've, mm -hmm. been, I've been told to leave meeting rooms, right? Uh, you know, without going into details, it's like, because I wasn't good enough. They were like, mate, don't turn up without the notes that I asked you to do. Simple as that. So cutthroat. Be become very confident and become very disciplined and outwork, aim to outwork everyone around you. Yeah, no, some really sound advice there, Adam. Um, so lastly, you said that, you know, you like to have something, um, there has to be something for you in a podcast. So I know your company is currently hiring at the moment. Mm -hmm. So please use this platform to tell the listeners what is it that, uh, Adam Rana and your company are looking for mm -hmm. in terms of brokers and you know put it out there yeah so as you guys know I'm a, an entrepreneur I have many companies but our main one is now uh, real estate brokerage sales and leasing in Dubai um, where we sell for investors and buy for investors and we need real estate brokers agent experience or unexperienced working for us we work with freedom we talked about it we have a freedom culture in our company we want people to come in and make as much money as possible uh, you can make you know, you know, you can make anywhere from 50,000 dirhams to 1 million dirhams in a month, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you work hard and you follow the advice I've just given, we're looking for people like that, driven and ambitious people to come and join our company. And obviously, me and you are always looking for people to buy with us and we provide a great service. So if anyone listening to this wants to buy with, you know, I don't know if I knew of our uh, listings with me and James, we have great connections. So yeah, hit us up. No, absolutely, guys. And look, I would... Uh Strongly recommend you go and follow him on Instagram. He's very, very active on Instagram. He's got some really good posts on there. You know, you'll see what he's done. And it's with Instagram is great because you can scroll right back to the beginning and you can see where Adam was all those years ago <laughs> and where Adam is now. And like you mentioned earlier, he's a very approachable person. So, you know, if you've got any questions, reach out to him. You mm -hmm. know, I'm sure he's not going to tell you to, well, he might tell you to bugger off, but. You yeah, know? well, I will. No, I will. <laughs> Some people, I'm not being funny because you can't ask, ask and not give. It's a transactional world. Yeah. So as yourself, you know, you do your coaching calls, you like help people. Like I can't call, I can't be on a call with 20, 100 people. Absolutely. Right. So bring something to the table. Okay, of course, I'm happy to help answer a question, but don't use and use. Um, I'm just being real. I'm sorry, but this is how it is. I'm not going to, if you keep asking me for, oh, send me this, Adam. I'm not, I'm not going to send you this. Help me as well. Yeah, yeah. A uh, little tip for you, I'd probably try and uh, persuade him with a cigar in a cigar lounge. That, that might work. <laughs> we should have had a cigar here, actually. <laughs> that yeah, that would, no, it's true. Take me off to have a good conversation with me. I'm not asking for I'm not asking for money. I'm not asking for give me something. Have a good conversation. Educate me on your life and say, oh, I'm a, I'm a lawyer or whatever you are, right? Even if you work in sales, tell me I did this and we have a cigar. Yeah. In Dubai. <laughs> <laughs> well adam listen thank you so much for joining uh on the second episode of season two of the j2r podcast i'm sure um you know uh you're going to be a success bro i said it to you when we first met mm. on what you were doing and it's really nice to sit and see where you've gone now with it all mm -hmm. and it'll be nice to see where you go in the next five years with it all especially with the vision the dreams and the clear goals that you guys mm -hmm. have got mm -hmm. but um yeah thanks man thanks for coming on to the show taking time out of your day to join me here on the J2Hub podcast. No, thank you for having me, James. Great conversation. Thank you. Cheers.